Hello, this is Nanansa, and you're watching The Homeland Story of the Returnee. This is thought provoking, inspirational, and motivational. And today, we have Mr. Hayford Atta Kofi. I'll be back with my guest soon. Stay tuned. Hello. My name is Kofi Opon Ochre, and I bring you NASA on DNT, a program designed to expose corruption and indiscipline in our society and advocate for the punishment of these offenders whose activities impede national development. The National Road Safety Commission indicates that Ghana loses 230 million US dollars to road accident, with over 1,600 dead recorded every year. In 2018, Shraj report indicated that Ghana loses 13.5 billion Ghana cities to corruption. A United Nations Children's Fund UNICEF has also stated that Ghana loses 290 million US dollars to poor sanitation alone. This is not right. So make a date with me and together let's name and shame the offenders of the law. NASA, see something, say something. Hello, welcome back. Mr. Atta Kofi is the new CEO of the National Pension Regulatory Authority. Uh, before that, he worked as a legal practitioner at Akofanache Chambers at Kumase. He studied in London and also came back to Ghana and studied law in the University of Ghana and also law school. Today with me, we have Mr. Hayford Atta Kofi. Hello, Mr. Hayford Atta Kofi. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. Well, before we start our show, we usually have a segment called Yes or No. Right. I ask the question and you just answer yes or no. Just simple yes or no. Just simple yes or right. no. Okay. Okay, my first question is, do you cook? No. <laughs> can you live without the internet? Yes, I can. Yes. For how long? Uh, for quite some time, I would say. Impressed. Yeah. Have you ever sent a text to the wrong person? Oh, yes. Do you mind me asking? Who? <laughs> no, not just one particular person. <laughs> but on WhatsApp, you know, you think you're sending a text to somebody and then it goes off, and even to a group. Okay. Have you ever <laughs> lost a fight? Oh, yes. <laughs> I would love to see, know which one is, but yeah. I'll move on to my, qu my next question. <laughs> Are you concerned about what others think about you? I do, I do, I do have concerns about that, yeah. Okay, thank you, and that was all my question for yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the yes and no segment with Mr. Kofi. So um, now back, in, back to the normal topics. As we always know, we start with the hobbies. Yeah. So to break the ice, we start with the hobbies. What are your favorite all-time hobbies? In terms of sports, I am a fan and a player of cricket. And it's not something that normally, you know, Ghanaians or a person of a Ghanaian descent would very much be involved in. But somehow I, I, I met a friend uh, in Achimota in my youthful days who introduced me to cricket and living in the UK, which is one of the national sports there. I really got into it and got many friends. and. And I, I, I live it, basically. I play, enjoy, and live it. Yeah. So do you have any other hobbies that you like apart from sports? Well, you seeing the world, you know, I, I love to travel. I really enjoy traveling and seeing places. Just recently I came back from India and even though the Taj Mahal was out of my way, I made it a point to travel okay. about 200 miles just to see the place because I've seen it on television in pictures and I just wanted to have a feel of it myself. I love seeing places. So how would you say your trip for India was for you? How did you feel? Did you get any enlightenment moments? Serious enlightenment and I, and I enjoyed it, you know, seeing different cultures, different attitudes, different places, different architecture. It was amazing. Yeah. How would you compare that with Ghana? Ghana has got its own places. Of course, you see, we, are, we take tourism for, really for granted. And I realized that coming back uh, from uh, living abroad, I realized I didn't know very much of Ghana. 
And I thought maybe okay, any time I came back, I, I made it a point to at least visit one place that I never had a chance to visit. Can you show me one of your favorite places in Ghana that you visited? I went to Kakum, you know, uh, the overhanging forest, yeah, uh, the canopy, it was amazing. You took also, the canopy walk? Yeah, to, I took the canopy. And I've been to a Fajitu as well, and I did the, the mountain walk. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. That's a bit. I would really love to talk more about hobbies and your tapping <laughs> into the industry. I really love. Sure. But then um, I want to know about your growing up, your early childhood stage. How was that like for you? And what was your motivation during those times? I grew up in Accra, you know, from the age of 10, because I remember, you know. So did part of my primary school in Accra. I went to Labon, the secondary school, uh, University of Ghana. Well, getting to my you know uh, adult ages, and I, I loved living around Accra here, you know, because uh, that's what I knew. You know, I, I grew up in Burma Camp because my, my 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 family were in the army, so I grew up around there, and. Uh, all the naughty things that schoolboys <laughs> will do, you know, chasing Bela and other things, you know. So I was basically a native boy, enjoyed running around and doing everything. But education was something that really propelled me, I must admit. And uh, I enjoyed my schooling, you know, everything aside. But all the things that you do after school, but I always made sure that education was something that was going to move me forward. So I had a very continuous education, school life. And uh, after university, I decided to have a stint in the army. You won't believe it. Really? Yeah. And how did that turn out <laughs> for you? Yeah. Now I did, I, I always call it my national service. So I did a very uh, a short service commission you know, in the army. And after I had served my nation, I decided that I would, I would travel outside. <laughs> Ooh, did, was there any inkling you wanted to further down your army path? No, it was always some kind of a fantasy for me, you know, to, 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 to feel like outside. And uh, it was my youthful days in, 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 the, in, in, in the law profession. Because when I, I left law school, I had to do a, a short practice at the Confernity Chambers, as you said, and uh, private practice was something that I, I really enjoyed, but I always felt that I needed more. I needed to see uh, a, 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 the, the world more and, and engage more in, in public service. So I joined the army and then continued my practice over there, but it was only for the short service. Yeah. Okay. Would you say you left Ghana for greener pastures or it was just for schooling or just another different experience to add to your experiences? Well, partly it was education. You know, I, I, I really wanted to further my education. Uh, so after I'd had a stint in the, in the armed forces, I felt that I wanted to take the law practice a little bit further on. So I wanted to go and do my master's and then the opportunity came from outside. And that's why, how I, I got myself in London. So I did my master's and also did the, the legal practice there. And then uh, I met my wife and then the family started coming along and I felt like, okay, let me stay on and then... I read in your biography that you were a solicitor and a barrister. Yeah. So how did you transition from solicitor to barrister? Like, did you decide to go back to law school after you were a solicitor for a while? Yeah, I mean, over here in Ghana, uh, at the time we went to law school, you, you combined the two, okay? So you were a solicitor of the Supreme Court and you were a barrister because of advocacy. But going to UK, then there was a clear pathway, whether you wanted to be a barrister or continue to be a solicitor. And I, I trained to be a barrister because I loved advocacy, you know, going to court, not just doing the paperwork, but you know, going to court and doing the advocacy, you know. So that's how I, I, I transitioned, as it were, yeah, into it. Well, you moved from Ghana and you went to UK to study your master's. So should I say your parents paid for it or you have to work your way through it or was it through scholarship? I had to work for it. I had to work uh, because, see, when I got to UK, uh, actually, I, I, I wanted to, to start practice straight away. 
I, I, whilst I was learning, but I was told that I needed to convert and it was going to be quite costly. So I needed to do the bar in UK before I could become so, uh, a, a barrister there. So I had to work. So I did a lot of part-time work and, and of course, part-time education. So it wasn't the government, it wasn't the parents, it was, I was... It was your own yeah, hard work, yeah, so hard it's work. never the easy way out. You still have to work to help yourself <laughs> get to the CEO levels. Yeah. Okay. Um, like, what was your motivation? What motivated you to even study law when you were growing up? I knew you're, you were in military camp, but what was it about law that pushed you in that direction? And I knew you had a love for cricket. Yeah. Why don't you divert to that path instead of law? I think, I don't know whether it was just by chance or accident or just by design. Uh, because growing up, I loved talking. You know, uh, I love engaging in debates, and I, I suppose you get a good teacher who is able to uh, give you a career path. And maybe because of my love for debate and advocacy, it was one of my teachers. His name is Mr. Ekufo. I used to teach us government, and he said, "Hey, Ford, I think you'll be a very good advocate. So why don't you try? You know." Uh, doing law. I wanted to be a TV personality. I wanted to be, <laughs> you know, uh, acting and, you know, getting Why? lines straight because it, it was all about engaging in conversation and stuff like that. So I, I, I didn't really put my mind towards uh, uh, um, law, but it was Mr. Kufu who actually uh, adverted my mind to it. And I'm always very grateful for that and I have had no regrets at all. That's amazing. So what would your most memorable experience be schooling in Ghana compared to schooling abroad? And how would you compare both in the term of learning and what you picked from both countries? Yeah. Oh, here in Ghana, I mean, growing up outside, running around with friends, you know, playing gutter to gutter, you know, <laughs> chaskeling, you know, those chasing Bela, you know, in around Burma camp. Those are memorable moments for me and friends that I made who I grew up with. And I would say living abroad, all my, my thoughts, my dreams and everything was always back home. You know, I would say that the body actually left, but the soul remained here. Home is where the heart is. <laughs> exactly. Home is where the heart is. <laughs> yeah. So how would you, how did you transition from Ghana and now you're abroad, you studied your masters. How was the work process in for you? Because I knew you did, a, you did a work as a principal yeah. for schools, yeah. which was amazing because then you passed for the offset standards. Yeah. That is rare and that's amazing. A lot of discipline in. You see, when I, when I, uh, I, I left law school. I, I worked uh, in a correctional you know, institution. Uh, at the time, I was undertaking like a, appeal process and procedures for them uh, because you, you needed to work your way up. And young people who had found themselves in in, in the crime chain, uh, I had to be their advocates. You know, working with young people as a lawyer. And I thought, and most of them were black people, it was, it was sad to say. And I thought, okay, now they've got themselves into this crime chain, but if they had got a mentor as young you know, people, they probably wouldn't have fallen into this situation. So why don't I get into that situation where I could help them as a teacher and guide them growing up to be successful? That is how I found myself in education and rose up to become a principal and there was this particular school in, in Tottenham in London which had about 95% black population no principal wanted to work there because behavior was oh. really really you know tough yeah. and I thought this is this is me this is a challenge you, you know? took up that challenge, and I took up that challenge. in London yes predominantly was, black school predominantly black school the school was failing and uh, I, I took on that challenge and I managed to raise the school to you know, a, 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 a offset standard. That's and, amazing. Yeah, and 
it was an incredible achievement and 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 i thought it was one of the highlights not so much because of the job but because of the achievement that yeah. i managed to achieve with the children this is, this that's is an amazing, amazing that's an amazing yeah. highlight to get to that <laughs> standard from yeah. if you know the system yeah. that's amazing um how would you compare the work ethics in Ghana and in London? I would say they're two worlds apart, okay? The work ethics in the UK is incredibly fast and incredibly, you know, punishing. And, you know, you just get up and get used to it. You know, there's nothing like rain, there's nothing like cold, there's nothing like, you know, heat, there's absolutely nothing. You just get on with it. No excuses at all because it's all happening around you and you get used to it and you you know but coming back home and looking at some of the work like there's the slowness sometimes excuses and sometimes the attitudes um it was very very worrying when i i came back initially and i felt that uh, i couldn't cope with it because i saw it as less productivity and more of excuses uh, and, and I decided that, okay, instead of giving in to it, I could change those who are around me and push them. Even if I don't get them to the ethics that I'm used to in the UK, at least I can raise them beyond the ethics of Ghana. And that's exactly what I've been trying to do in my, in my work setting here. And I must say, people are really responding to it and I'm very, very excited. Well, this conversation is interesting. We're going to have a short break and we'll be back soon. You're watching Homeland and we're on a short break right now. Stay tuned, don't move. This is an interesting story you don't want to miss. Let me guess, you're probably wondering, Another talk show? What could they possibly have to talk about? Relationships, gossip, or entertainment? What if we bring it all to you in the good, the bad, and the ugly way? Yes, you heard that right. We're bringing you the latest stories from around the world and right here in Ghana. We come with our unique backgrounds and beliefs. But when we come together, we put all our wild thoughts and concerns on the table. So sit back, relax, as we bring you the good, the bad and the ugly. Coming soon on DNT. Welcome to the Daily Altar, where each day we bring to you a morning experience designed to inspire, empower you to manifest God's fullness in your life. Most Christians today are struggling spiritually when it comes to spending time with God. But the psalmist in Psalm 5 verse 3 says, My voice you will hear in the morning. Oh Lord, in the morning I will direct it to you and I will look up. Join me every morning from 5 a.m. on the daily altar to encounter God through his word, prayer, and worship. I am Bishop Sami Apare Loko from the Action City Church. God richly bless. Oh, shout your name, for you are God of yourself. Hello, my name is Kofi Upon Ochre, and I bring you NASA on DNT, a program designed to expose corruption and indiscipline in our society and advocate for the punishment of these offenders whose activities impede national development. The National Road Safety Commission indicates that Ghana loses. 230 million US dollars to road accident, with over 1,600 dead recorded every year. In 2018, Shraj report indicated that Ghana loses 13.5 billion Ghana cities to corruption. A United Nations Children's Fund UNICEF has also stated that Ghana loses 290 million US dollars to poor sanitation alone. This is not right. So make a date with me, and together let's name and shame the offenders of the law. NASA, see something, say something. Welcome back to Homeland, the story of the returning. And today we're sitting with a Mr. Amazing Atta Kofi. 
and um, I would just love to continue the story with you where we left off and that was a transition in between your work ethic in Ghana and also in UK and then when you came back what was your aha moment the moment that you thought I'm over this I'm ready to go back right of course uh, the thing about me staying abroad uh, was that I always, always felt that one day I'm going to come home. And what I've been able to do in England for England, I could reciprocate that in my country. So I always felt that one day I would come back. And therefore, coming back in 2015 wasn't something that was too difficult a decision to take. But coming back and then uh, realizing that the systems had changed and of course when i was here in, in in law practice you just got on with it when i was here in the army the, the work ethics there was like yes but coming back you know so many years after society had changed attitudes had you know moved on and i had grown you know of course in terms of age and i felt that the, the system wasn't something that I could cope with. Things were much slower than I expected. Systems were not straightforward, you know, to even register a, a company it took so much time and, and all the other things that you may not even want to talk about on camera and all those <laughs> things. So at some point I felt that, no, I think I have become institutionalized abroad mm. and therefore I would have to go back. Go back. back. But then that was where family support, friend support, you know, started kicking in. And I felt, let me give it a try. And I also, I loved something about Ghana, which is the hustle and the bustle of political life. You know, everything about, about that is really exciting. And I'm also a bit of a political animal put it that way and I felt let me let me let me be part of this one and see how the system will run and those were some of the things that got me to sober down and see okay I'm gonna confront the situation and see if I can change a few things around it that's what made me stay but there was so much that really pushed me to to go abroad so I'll go back so you say you had a tribe a support system that made you see the vision you already had just yeah. pushing you in the right direction yeah. and without that you would have just I just, just returned. given up and, and, and gone back yeah I mean I, I, I even to some extent I went back but I would say it was just to get myself ready to prepare myself you know my, get a psyche mm -hmm. right and also to get a few things which I wasn't getting over here which sometimes made me feel I want to go back so I went to prepare and not just physical preparation, but also mental preparation. And that was about three months. And I had to come back here, yeah. So where, what would be some of your successful reflection if you look back right now, even to London and Ghana, you're growing up, how it all contributed to you being here today? I think I would put it down to family and friend support, really. Yeah. I mean, I have nothing to be personally uh, achieved as a success other than what people have said to me and about me that has really pushed me and urged me on. So that kind of social network, the social support, uh, I think those are the, the highlights that I can think of. I mean, maybe somebody saying things about me might be different, but mm -hmm. how this is how I perceive, yeah. you know, some of the the successes that I have managed to chalk. Yeah. That's amazing. So, to, what I'm getting from this is when you have a great support system and yeah. people that see the vision with you yeah. and pushes you in the right direction, it's yeah. easier to follow that path instead of turning yeah. back. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, what would what would have been what's your breakthrough moment so when you got here apart from your family support and everything what was your breakthrough moments that you officially was like okay i'm ready i'm ready to battle this out in ghana and contribute to the system yeah um when i when i came over i actually went back to my my law practice and tried to set up a small chamber and i was working and i had also done some 
project management whilst I was in the UK because I, I used to do a lot of short courses. Uh, so I, I had a, a breakthrough with the Ministry of Education, but it was on projects uh, with the USAID. You know, yeah, USAID, they gave me uh, a project uh, contract. And that was what actually gave me, I would say, a sustained uh, um, employment, as it were. It was contractual, but I thought, okay, this is how I'm going to break into the system. And also, because it was a U.S. project, some of the ethics and the attitude towards it was also something similar to what I was used to. So mm. that was my break moment, and then gradually I worked through that until I was given a call by the president, you know, to take up this role here, which I find myself in. That's amazing. Um, so my whole thing is, um, what are your contributions to Ghana right now? What would you say, like, your goal, what you want to contribute and how you want the system to change for the later generations to come? See, we, we have one country and everything that we do is aimed towards putting a small jigsaw piece into making the country work. I wouldn't say, for example, that I have done something tremendously uh, outstanding. But I believe that in changing people's attitude, in supporting people through education, uh, in, in, in managing people's life on a day-to-day basis, whether they're friends or family or even people you don't know, you are changing lives. And I think that is, you know, uh, that is something that I, I, I enjoy doing, you know. Uh, encouraging and changing lives and, and then supporting people generally. Um, I, I, I take on a very massive advisory work. Sometimes when I get feedback from people as to how they have found inspiration in what I have done or said to them, I also take comfort from that. That's and amazing. Think, mm -hmm. And my big question is, I know pension usually when you're working for government based, you have, you're already on the scheme. So what about people in the creative industry and people that do petty trades and people that are not within the government facility? How do they go about with their pensions and do they register? Is it a way they can tap into the pension scheme? Yeah. I mean, when, when I was given this job and I had uh, not done, I mean, I had done work in investments and I had done work in, in um, aspects of uh, social security or but I hadn't actually done work in the setting as we find us in a, in a regulatory setting. Um, so I, for initially I found it a bit of a challenge, but I realized that it is, it is, it is the greatest honor that the president has given me because if you look at our country, 85% of our population are outside the formal sector. You know, they work for themselves, you know, whether it's the creative arts or whether it's in their own businesses or whether they are traders, because we're a nation of traders, literally. And because they don't work in a formal setting and get monthly salary, you know, for which maybe a portion is taken away mandatorily to go into their pension, these people find themselves outside the pension uh, spectrum. And when they grow, older to the extent that they cannot work again, they become a burden on the society. And here, we don't have the door system, uh, people are held by central government and stuff like that. So one of the things that I found myself increasingly doing is to try and expand pensions into the informal sector, into people like the category that you've just you know, indicated. And I, I, my role here also involves advising governments on matters of pension. And so we have set up uh, an informal sector pension system which is running. So we, we're looking at cocoa farmers, we're looking at market women, we're looking at drivers and uh, what we call them the GPRTU, the Ghana Private Road Transport Union. We're looking at uh, spare parts dealers. So people who are outside the formal spectrum gradually bringing pension to their 
to their doorsteps and also educating them, sensitizing and educating them that you can also have pension. And pension is not that about big payments. It could be as little as two cities, five cities, because little drops of water, they say, make a mighty ocean, isn't yeah. it? So when you start early, then you have, I mean, in, in, I mean, in Ghana, you have 15 years to have a full pension. So 15 years of contribution and you have a full pension. So those are some of the things, steps that we, we've been taking since I came into this role to try and expand pension outside the formal sector. That's amazing. So I can register. F I can register for pension. Absolutely. And I can choose the amount I want to put into my you pension. You can choose your fund manager. You know, uh, you could have your trustee, a corporate trustee. We have in Ghana here. We have about thirty corporate trustees, and you can sign up with any of them, and you make your contributions to them. Then they will invest your money for you, or with a bank, or with any of the investable instrument, government government bonds, or anything. They don't. They will not put it in savings and loans. They won't put it in men's <laughs> gold. Don't worry about that, right? because we have strict rules as to where pension funds can be invested. And it grows, it grows, you know, and uh, yes, so anybody, and it's, it, it, there's no upper or lower limit, as you can afford. And it doesn't even have to be consistent. If you feel that at the end of this week or this month, you are not able to, that's fine, so long as you go up and then make up for it. So patience is for everyone. And that is something that I have made it my gospel to try and preach across because there's a whole lot of misconception that you have to be a blue or white colored worker to enjoy a pension. That is not mm. the case. At so all. pension is for everyone. So if you're even on the market selling and um, you're a creative art industry, you can always register to have your pension open. And is there any organization, particular names that we can search to go to if I want to open one? Is it like a Top organization, you can tell me to. Let me tell you a story. You know, when I came back from UK and I got into this job, actually, I, I, I launched what is called Diaspora Pension, okay. where people in the diaspora could contribute pensions over there, and then when they retire and come home or when they want to settle back home here, then they can you know, tap into it. And uh, during the lunch, I did it at the uh, uh, International Conference Center. And then somebody asked me this same question, and I gave an example. So oh, you can you can sign up with X Y corporate trustee. The following day, my voicemail was full. Now you're giving business oh, to this particular. Okay, okay. <laughs> and you're the regulator, and you're going to mention X Y. So mm. you've given job business to them, and you're promoting them. So I've always. I've learned oh, the you lesson. You, so you reserve your comments. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you can speak to me on the quiet and I, I, can, I can advise you on okay. that Okay. So would you say if I go online, I can find some on of the companies? On the NPRA website, our website, there's a whole lot, and I said there are 30 of them, okay. 30 corporate trustees, and you can sign up with any one of them. And the good thing is that we have ranked them on the size of the asset that they manage. So I suppose you can also take your your, your, your cue out of that, yeah. That's amazing. So what is your whole assessment of the legal system in Ghana? It is still developing. Uh, visited the courts a few times. I'm, I'm currently, because of my role, I am not practicing. Uh, but I did practice when I, when I came back. And I realized that the, the, the legal system had really improved. Um, but we still have a problem with the length of the time to go through the whole prosecution process. Uh, and even in civil cases, this is even much, much, much longer. I know the government has tried to introduce commercial calls. They're trying to tr introduce some kind of digitization in, in, in the whole legal process to speed up because justice delayed, they say is justice denied. Um, so there has been a lot of improvement uh, since the time I qualified as a lawyer, but there's still more work to do in terms of people not getting justice on time and also the kind of relationship that exists between lawyers and their clients is still not up to speed as I expected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it 
Would you say it's every Ghanaian's dream from abroad to come back? Or would you say a normal Ghanaian should travel abroad to experience people coming back? Would you advise an average Ghanaian to travel abroad to experience and bring it back? Travel is good. I mean, I think it broadens your horizon. Uh, it, it certainly for me, it has given me a lesson in life that I could not have learned in any school or any teacher could have given me. You experience different environment, different people, different work ethics, you know, different attitude to law and society and all those things. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a positive thing. But it is always, always best to come back home, you know, and, and, and replicate what you've experienced there and also try and change attitude so that we can, we can move our nation, you know, to a, to a level in you know, a little bit higher than we, 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 we left it. Because it's, I think it's a legacy that we always bring back, you know, the positive legacy from what we learn outside that we bring. And also the knowledge that we acquire physically in you know, education and all those things. We need to bring it back and use that to impact on society. So yeah, travel is good, but coming back home is it's even better. better. <laughs> Thank you so much. So yeah. that was um, our conversation with Mr. Kofi, and we're going to come back soon with more. Don't go anywhere. Stay in tune for more. Every weekday at 12 and 5 p.m., DNT Newsroom brings you the most topical, fact-based and up-to-date news from Ghana and around the world. Politics, business, Sports and news from the diaspora all covered in this comprehensive news update. If it matters, DNT News will have it covered. DNT News, be informed. Let me guess, you're probably wondering. Another talk show? What could they possibly have to talk about? Relationships? Gossip? Or entertainment? What if we bring it all to you in the good, the bad, and the ugly way? Yes, you heard that right. We're bringing you the latest stories from around the world and right here in Ghana. We come with our unique backgrounds and beliefs. But when we come together, we put all our wild thoughts and concerns on the table. So sit back, relax, as we bring you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Coming soon on DNT. Welcome to the Daily Altar, where each day we bring to you a morning experience designed to inspire, empower you to manifest God's fullness in your life. Most Christians today are struggling spiritually when it comes to spending time with God. But the psalmist in Psalm 5 verse 3 says, My voice you will hear in the morning. Oh Lord, in the morning I will direct it to you and I will look up. Join me every morning from 5 a.m. on the daily altar to encounter God through his word, prayer, and worship. I am Bishop Sami Apare Loko from the Action City Church. Vision God richly bless. Oh, shout your name, for you are God of yourself. Hello, my name is Kofi Upon Ochre, and I bring you NASA on DNT, a program designed to expose corruption and indiscipline in our society and advocate for the punishment of these offenders whose activities impede national development. The National Road Safety Commission indicates that Ghana loses. 230 million US dollars to road accident, with over 1,600 dead recorded every year. In 2018, Shraj report indicated that Ghana loses 13.5 billion Ghana cities to corruption. A United Nations Children's Fund UNICEF has also stated that Ghana loses 290 million US dollars to poor sanitation alone. This is not right. So make a date with me, and together let's name and shame the offenders of the law. NASA, see something, say something. Welcome back. I hope you didn't move, and if you did, and you haven't been watching what I'm watching, and not listening, 
come sit down while watching the story of the returnee. Homeland. Homeland. Um, have you heard of the brain drain is brain gain? Well, this is the perfect scenario for it. You travel abroad to gain all the knowledge possible, come back home and use it. Hello, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Kofi. Yes. Um, I love what you said, travel out, get all the experiences you can and bring them back and help your community yeah. and help home. And what would you say to people outside that want to come back? What mentality should they come back with? Um, what are some of the challenges they might face? And what would be your encouragement to them? And those that don't also want to come back, what would be the encouragement to them? Okay. Right. Um, those who have traveled abroad and gained all the experiences, uh, as I indicated earlier, it's always good to bring that experience back home uh, to help your nation. Ghana has got a lot of potential. And the potential can be tapped with all the experience that we have acquired you know, outside. Yes, of course, there are people here who haven't traveled, but they have also got a wealth of knowledge. But it's a combination of what they have acquired in here and what you bring abroad and marry the two. That is what's going to move our nation forward. There are some people out there who have decided that, look, because the systems here are not running as effectively as they run out there, that they may not get the things that they get so easily out there, they, they would choose to stay out there. I think that is a wrong, wrong perception and something that we need to discourage because somebody made that society that you're enjoying what it is and it, you can also make your society what you want it to be. Because room wasn't you know. built in a day. Exactly, you know. And for me, because I, I, I love to, to travel and also I, I, I love you know, to, to read about places and I do know situations where even London mm -hmm. was like not too long ago and even there are certain places that you still visit these days where situations are just like ours. Yes. So it is what we make of a place that is what it is and therefore i would encourage Ghanaians everywhere that the knowledge that we have gained we need to bring it so that the brain gain that we can bring to our country can help move our nation forward i mean our our, our president is a living example you know he had his basic education uh, abroad, you know, he had his legal training abroad, and I think from the age of about 35, he thought, that's it, let me bring my knowledge home and do a public service. And he once said to me, Krufi, if you want to work with me, know that working in our country is for public service. If you want to make money, go to private sector. <laughs> yeah. You can make as much money as you want, but working in public service is, 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 is devotion, devotion to the nation. And I think we all need to do it. And I see myself in, in this current role as doing my national service. Yes. And I, I, I entreat every Ghanaian everywhere to bring any knowledge experience that they have gained back home and bring it to our country and they can make our nation better. So you're saying you're holding a pledge? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that's amazing. Thank you so much for that. I've got some words of encouragement from it. And um, before we end this, we usually have our end segment, which is called the Big Six. Right. So I ask you six questions, and you choose either or. So the question is either or questions. Right. So, okay. Let me okay. psych myself for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So the big six, here it goes. Formal or traditional? Traditional. Why? I'm a traditional person. Uh, because our, our, our country is, is based on a, on a rich culture, on a rich tradition. And uh, we have to enhance it, we have to make it work. Of course, within the tradition, so there's some formality, of course. But for me, in my dictionary, when we say formal, it's too foreign for me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we do go on yet. Yeah. <laughs> Politician or preacher? Politician. Why? I love politics. We are all political animals. 
Yeah. Uh, and I believe our country has taken a path of democracy. And democracy is always uh, uh, a case of, of, of an advocacy because it's the government, the government of the majority. And if you are not able to advocate what is good so that you have the right on your side, you know, you have the wrong people running your country for you and running your country down. So I chose the part of politics very early on. Okay, brains or beauty? Brains or beauty? <laughs> I like brains. Brains. So brains completely loving an ounce of beauty. Brain is beautiful. That's so much. <laughs> <laughs> Very wonderful. Money or fame. Fame in the sense of living a good image, living a good legacy, living a, a good example for people, you know, uh, to follow. I mean, there are people who are dead long ago, but because of the legacy they left behind, they get quoted, they get the fame out of, of, out of the, uh, or I would say, uh, it, it counts for the money, out of the fame. I mean, I, I love quoting Einstein. I don't think Einstein was any person who would have been matched when it comes to money or anything like that. But because of the fame of the knowledge that he left behind, he's always remembered. So, yeah. Structured or structured routine or go with the flow? I would like to go with the flow. How often do you go with the flow? <laughs> yeah, I go with the flow. I mean, be part of it, you know, in order to, to change it. If you're not in it, you cannot win it. And, and, and being part and going with the flow, to me, it, it makes you fit in. It makes you fit in well. And I will always go with the flow. My final and favorite of all, you have to choose either or, which is sing or dance. Dance, of course. Yeah. Since you've chosen dance, I'm sorry, but I have to put you on the spot, and we have to groove. I'm going to do the beats for you. So I'm going to say you like, I like hip life jazz. Oh, I love my hip life. Hip life. I love my hip life. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. So who's your favorite artist right now? I have a whole myriad of them, but I think for now, Kim Promise is on top of my choice. Yeah. Yes! Yes, the youth and hearts. <laughs> We'll stay in DNTV, you're gonna get all the juice, every juice. You've let's can promise. Like that. What's up? What's up? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> That's political. I can't really choose that. Yeah. Thank you for watching. This is such an amazing and I'm inspired and I'm motivated. And thank you so much for your time and thank you for having us. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And also thank you for having me. Thank it's been you a wonderful so moment. Much. Thank you. You're watching Homeland, the story of the returning. This is your host, Nana Ansa. And I hope you enjoyed today as much as I did. We're talking about go abroad, gain all the knowledge, everything can, and bring it home. Help build home. Rome wasn't built in a day. And we definitely don't want to leave Mother Ghana. It's still young, like international have been around for years. We're still developing. Stay in tune and keep watching Homeland. We've been great, great, great guests. And today, I would say, maybe not be politically correct, but my favorite so far, <laughs> Mr. Hey for that thank you, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye for now.